Hello, everybody. I'm Raj. I'm Eddie. I'm Ashwin. And this is Blood Cancer Talks, a podcast exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring in thought leaders who live and breathe a particular disease and discuss about the biology and clinical management. Today, we are digressing from our usual format of how I treat style episode focusing on a particular disease. Instead, we have a very special episode in store for you. Today, we will discuss how to take care of terminally ill patients as they approach end of life, something we all do on a daily basis as malignant hematologists. And there is no better person to discuss this topic than Dr. Azra Raza. Dr. Raza is the director of the Myelodysplastic Syndrome Center at Columbia University and Chan Soon Xiong, professor of medicine. Dr. Raza is a polymath, an astute clinician with a busy practice of patients with MDS, has a basic science research lab, and oversees one of the largest tissue repositories of MDS patients. She's also the author of a popular book, The First Cell, which is a must read not only for hematologists, oncologists, but anyone taking care of terminally ill patients. On top of all of this, she's a dedicated reader of Urdu poetry, which in her own words is crispered into her DNA. So Dr. Raza, before we start, can you tell us about yourself and your clinical and research focus? Um, thank you very much, Raj, Ashwin, and Eddie. I'm delighted to be on this podcast. Uh, anytime young people pay any attention to me, I'm very flattered. So thank you. About myself, you know, I grew up in Pakistan. And as a teenager, I read a book where they made the point using the biography of Virchow that the human body is like a state and every cell is citizens and citizens have to follow rules. And one of the rules they have to follow is that they need to stay where they were born in the organ of origin. So liver cells stay in the liver, pancreatic cells in the pancreas, lung cells in the... Only in one condition do they walk out of the organ and that is cancer. So that grabbed me intellectually as something terribly dramatic. How do cells develop the ability to walk out and develop this mobility? And then the other thing is, of course, that we in our own body give birth to a cell which can live forever. It behaves like a new species. It's like a whole species that now treats the body as an adverse environment in which it has to survive for its own good. It does everything. So I figured that, oh, if I can unlock the secret of a cancer cell, I can unlock the secret of aging. And these two things intellectually fascinated me. How does a cancer cell live forever and how does it walk out and around? But then, you know, as I grew up, and went to med school, I saw my first cancer patient. And the kind of cancer patients we saw in Pakistan in the 70s, you guys cannot dream about, especially in the Western countries, because here cancer is diagnosed much earlier. In Pakistan in the 1970s, People would travel for weeks on bullock carts and donkey carts and come to the city literally with family members holding big tumors, growing from their back, osteogenic sarcomas, the worst breast cancers. And you could smell a cancer patient a mile away. Cancer has a very peculiar smell, by the way which none of you can ever experience because we were seeing really these end-stage fungating masses that look so horrifying. And so to my intellectual fascination, now this issue of seeing a cancer patient added the emotional di dimension, the emotional investment that a true quest in life requires because it cannot be just intellectual. You have to have emotional investment. So to introduce myself, I took some time to tell you this because I knew from the moment I saw my first cancer patients that the rest of my life will be spent in trying to reduce the anguish and suffering of these individuals, but also try to move the field forward. So keep trying to do basic research. 
because knowledge should not just be learnt. Knowledge should be contributed to also. And it is the responsibility of each one of us to try to do that for the sake of our patients. Therefore, I have never given up seeing patients. I see 30 to 40 cancer patients every week in my clinics. I supervise a basic research lab, which was well-funded by NIH with two program project grants and multiple R01s for 25 years. Now I need much more money than NIH can give. So I have much bigger grants from other agencies. But always had a basic research lab. And in addition, the last thing I want to say is that I'm also a cancer widow. My husband was the head of the cancer center and got the very disease he had dedicated his life to cure since he was 15 years old. In a cruel twist of irony, he dies of leukemia. And so the point I'm making is that, in fact, I have stood on both sides of the bed now. I have been a caregiver as well as a caretaker. And so I have had a chance to see cancer from practically every angle possible. Something that I wouldn't wish on my enemies. Yeah, it's it's certainly a, it gives you a new perspective on things when you experience things from the bedside or the carer side than when you're treating patients as a doctor. One of the things you mentioned in your book is that you asked Elizabeth Kubler-Ross after rounds for if she could give you one piece of advice about talking to terminally ill patients about how much time they had left, what it would be. And she said that, that you shouldn't volunteer that information. I wonder if you had one piece of advice to younger clinicians to talking to patients coming to the end of life, what would that piece of advice be? What would your top advice be about having those conversations? I am not exactly sure, Eddie, that the question you are asking is if I have one piece of advice for a doctor or for a patient. It was about a doctor, but I think both are interesting questions. So what would be my one piece of advice to a doctor who's supposed to have a conversation with a terminally ill patient? Is that what you're saying? I see. Eddie, I find this a very interesting dichotomy in medicine. And it reminds me of the, the series. Have you seen The Crown? Okay. Yes, yeah. So The Crown is about Queen Elizabeth II. And since she was a teenager, she was the crown princess. So we knew that she has to be raised to become the king, Queen of England one day. And she was constantly taught that you must not get involved. You must never show emotion. You are closer to divinity than anyone else. And you mustn't speak to the commoners like they are someone like you because they're not. And then that's how she grew up. Very reserved, very formal, keeping a distance. Suddenly there was some kind of a landslide or an avalanche or something. And lots of school children got killed, like 63 children in a school got killed. And now everyone was hankering for the queen to show up there. But she knew that if she goes, she'll break down. Who can take the death of 63 children and not show emotion? And when she didn't go, the entire country came down so hard on her yelling at her. And she had to then go. You know, this was one episode of The Crown. But when I saw it, I started to think, that my mentor was my later who became my husband. My mentor taught me the same thing. Do not get emotionally involved with your patients because if you do, you can never make hard decisions because emotions cloud judgment. Yet Eddie Van Harvey himself was diagnosed with cancer. The first thing he did, he turned to me and said, as you're going to take care of me. I was so shocked. I said, what are you talking about? You told me never to be involved with patients emotionally. And now you want me to take care of you? And he just said, well, I can only trust your judgment. So I'm afraid you'll have to. But this is the dichotomy that we are brought up and trained not to get involved emotionally with patients. But what are patients expecting of you? 
tell me the three of you they expect you to show emotions they expect you to understand to empathize to show compassion to be there for them so what are you supposed to do play act or sincerely feel something for the patient these are the things that i constantly struggle with in this country of course, you might have guessed, I never listened to my mentor's advice and always got totally emotionally involved with all my patients because I felt like unless I stand in their shoes, I cannot really begin to even empathize with them. So my advice to the young doctors is, don't be scared of getting emotionally involved because it's important to be emotionally involved. But to understand, in fact, that when people have a terminal illness, whether they acknowledge it in that those words or not, whether you have told them in those words or not, there is some kind of an understanding that this is not going well. In that situation, Individuals cannot look way into the future because you can't plan for five years from now. When that happens, young doctors generally get anxious about things. My advice is that when you cannot look ahead, then everything gets turned on its head in the sense that now becomes very important. Today suddenly acquires a whole new meaning. And so, as doctors, my advice to you is to be emotionally involved, to understand what your patient's 3 a.m. agenda looks like, what are they worried about, what is going through their mind. And for the patients also to know that if there is even the slightest chance that they may not be alive five years from now or one year from now or one month from now, then how would they like to spend the last few days happy, showing their love, receiving love? What sort of a final few days should they have? Painless. You have to take care of their pain. So unless you are involved in this kind of thing, how are you going to walk the patients through the most difficult part of their lives? How can you make it the most precious part of their life is your duty. And once you know that you cannot offer too many solutions in terms of curative therapies, then the role of the doctor is even more essential in helping the patient realize that no matter what happens, the doctor is going to have their back, is going to make the right decisions for them and help them through it. Yeah, I think that's really important. And it's, I think it's just, I sort of think of it like a spectrum of, we all have colleagues who are very emotionally involved and very emotionally detached and where you sit as an individual and where we sit as a specialty on that spectrum, I think is really important. There's a fantastic social worker who taught me the term sit in the rubble, which is the idea that sometimes you can't, as doctors, we want to fix things and we want to make people, you know, cure people and make them better. And sometimes you can't, and sometimes that can be very frustrating as a doctor, but that sometimes what we can offer is we can sit with the patient and their family in the rubble. And as you say, empathize and be, you know, do our best to make whatever time they do have left as, as good as possible. The point you got to just at the end is something I'm really fascinated about in the areas that we work, which is this dichotomy between curable and incurable. And if you think about, say, some of the diseases that we like to think of as curative, I find sometimes the idea, like you might be talking about a patient in a group of doctors and everyone in that room knows that there's no hope for that patient to achieve cure because they've had, you know, seven relapses or something like that. But then you go and see that same patient in, in the clinic or on the hospital floor and it's very clear that their perception is very different to that whole room full of oncologists. So I'd love it if you could talk a bit about, particularly in hematologic malignancies, this idea of curative versus non-curative and when that line gets blurred, how you think about that and how you try and convey that to patients. You'll be surprised to hear this, Eddie, but I have never cured a single patient. Never. Because the only cure for MDS and acute leukemia, the diseases I treat, is through a bone marrow transplant. And when that point comes, we turn them over to the transplant team. I don't do anything to cure people. 
I'm only doing palliative care constantly in a way. And so for me, this is a particularly important issue. When I came to this country, something became very clear to me, my own anxieties. The anxiety was, I am here in a different culture suddenly. Patients come, they are under tremendous pressure because of the illness. They are trying to tell their story, but it becomes completely fragmented. I'm sure all three of you have experienced the fact that first, the patient is unable to give a smooth accounting of how the symptoms started, what happened. Then so many interruptions by family members who have a different take on the thing. No, that's not how it happened. So the story changes from mouth to mouth. The story changes from week to month. And you are constantly under pressure about, did I not hear? What did they not say? What can I do to record the story so clearly in the charts that the next doctor will have a clear view? And this was my anxiety about how to reconcile fragmented stories of patients and families constantly changing into a readable, accurate narrative. But for that, poetry helps me a lot because poetry has got two lines. But you can read a macro cosm in those two lines of ma microcosm. Why? Because every word becomes very important. Not only that, you have to read between the lines. You have to train yourself in a way to hear the way the blind hear. The blind, how do they hear? Because they can't see their other faculties become much sharper. They hear more hearingly. And that's the kind of hearing that we have to develop to hear more hearingly, to be able to, uh, to be able to understand why narrative medicine is so important to get the patient's story right and to be able to help them properly. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I especially, especially your comments about communicating from one one person to the next and especially when we're talking about uh, patients having an understanding of their prognosis especially if that prognosis is not good and how that's been communicated to them and how they feel about it I think it can be very hard to get that sense from a medical record unless you've been there and had the conversation with the patient right so I wanted to next touch upon a, another important concept of prognostic uncertainty something we all struggle with while caring for patients at the end of their lives um, in heme malignancies for example I recently had a patient uh, with very aggressive myeloma who had relapsed after multiple lines of therapy and with declining performance status and my best guess was that his life expectancy would be in months definitely not years it would, it would be likely in months or maybe even weeks However, he was eligible for an early phase clinical trial of a promising agent, and both the family and I struggled whether to proceed with the trial and risk side effects on time toxicity versus let nature take its course and let him spend the remaining time with family. So we would love to hear how you deal with prognostic uncertainty in your practice and what strategies do you use to counsel patients in such, such circumstances? I mean, those are issues that all of us deal on a daily basis. And we I wish I had a more and a neat answer for you. But again, it depends on the individual we are dealing with. How much are they ready to accept? How much do they want to even know? And a lot of patients put the burden of uh, their decisions upon the doctors. In fact, Eric Fromm, the great American philosopher has a great book called Escape from Freedom. Think of the name, Escape from Freedom. We as humans want to hand over our decision-making process to some leader, some parent-like figure, some doctor, some teacher, someone else, because the responsibility is too much. And doctors, in order to not have to make those decisions, 
have also fallen back on, oh, there is strength in numbers. So let's have NCC and guidelines. Let's all get together, review all the existing literature and come up with guidelines. And those are all good things. The problem is it's hard to apply all of those to an individual because in the end, it becomes your responsibility as an individual doctor to be dealing with an individual patient. And guidelines are all well and good. But like you said, things vary from day to day with patients. Even today, what you advise them may not be good for them tomorrow. Let me give you just one example of how patients really know what's going on, even if they don't admit it in so many words. In my book, The First Cell, I talk about a young patient, Andrew, who's 22 years old, who's diagnosed with cancer. With a an exceedingly malevolent, malignant glioblastoma multiforme, which was stage four already all over. A time came when his treating oncologists knew that they can't offer anything else. He is practically done for. And so they asked him to sign a DNR. He sent them back. He said, I'm not signing it. Take it away. So they took it away. That evening, Raj, his father came to spend the night with him. And his mother and sister, who had been there all day with him, left. As soon as the father came, Andrew sent for the nurses, asked them to bring the form back, signed it, saying... I couldn't do it in front of my mother. She wouldn't be able to take it. This is what we are dealing with. 22-year-old boy who's dying is protecting his mother. What are you and I going to advise him? So my point is we have to be very sensitive to the dynamics. They shouldn't have brought the form in front of his mother and his sister. How are you telling the boy to sign and say, do not resuscitate me when he's the only son of this woman? How? Whose fault was that? Little things is what I'm pointing out to you. Not just big issues like should we treat him, should we not? No, little things like this are important. You have to be exquisitely sensitive to the needs of your patients at every level. Everyone meant well. The problem is the oncologist who had been taking care of him this poor boy was admitted for four months in the hospital until the time came when his hospice and he died. In four months, the oncologist who was one floor up never came to see him. In my book, I go back to the families years later and ask them to tell me what decision they would have changed in retrospect. What things would they have done differently? Because I want to hear from patients' families. After you've lost the patients, go back now with the luxury of time in between where you've had some leisure to register what has happened even. What would you change? And the thing that both Andrew's mother and sisters complained about was how hurt they felt that the oncologist that Andrew loved could not come down to say hello to him for four months until he died. And why didn't he come? I know the oncologist very well. He's got a soft heart. He couldn't deal with the fact that a 22-year-old is dying. And he knew that just like Queen Elizabeth, had he gone, he would have broken down. But who is he protecting, himself or Andrew? He didn't want Andrew to go through more unpleasant things. We don't, we have no perfect solutions for these things, Raj. I think that 
the most important thing to me over and over is be emotionally involved and be there. Whether it's good or bad, be there, be present and let them talk to you more. You can just make sounds by your and be present and that will help the patients. How it would have helped his mother and sister to know that a doctor cared. So you decide based on this uh, case story I told you. What is good or what is bad here? Well, I think that's really helpful. And being there, and that's so important. And sometimes we underestimate the importance of that when patients are in the hospital. I'll care. give you another yeah. example, sure. guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is that my husband, who died after a five-year-long battle with cancer, I had brought him home on hospice also. Now, when he was diagnosed, my daughter Shahrzad was four years old. And I tried to treat Harvey as much as I could at home. So lots of uh, IVs, everything was you know, antibiotics, antifungals. I was giving him at home. So poor Shahrzad, she grew up thinking that dad is always attached to an IV pole and that's natural and normal kind of thing. Anyway, after he dies when she's eight years old. A few weeks, three weeks after he died, she became very sick with the flu suddenly. And, you know, her asthma got uh, uh, reignited and she was really having a tough time. But it took five, six days for the fevers to go down and her to catch her breath and started getting better. One morning I was sitting in the family room working and she woke up and came out crying inconsolably. As a mother, I panicked immediately, thinking she's worse. I said, what's wrong? Are you feeling sick? What's happened? And for a while, she couldn't even tell me what had happened until finally she said no. She was able to control herself and said, no, mom. Actually, I feel fine now. But what I realize is how horrible it is to feel sick and how good it is to feel better. And my dad never got better, she said. And that's why I'm crying. An eight-year-old, a 22-year-old have these sensitivities, Raj. Thank you, Dr. Raza, for sharing those two important stories. Uh, one other question I had is in the current model of care where uh, this world of outpatient and inpatient medicine is completely segregated, now, patients are often cared by a different team at their most vulnerable moments. Also, some patients opt for hospice at end of life and may be cared by a hospice physician and not necessarily by their primary oncologist who they have long-term relationship with. What are your thoughts about this model and how do you deal with such situations? I think my thoughts are exactly what your thoughts are, that it's very abnormal in a way to do this kind of uh, compartmentalization. And especially at the end of life, when the patients really need the oncologist who's cared for them for years and years to now be completely absent and be handed over to a team to die. I mean, it's very abnormal and it's very soul shattering in a way for the patients. My heart goes out. I mean, my patients, when they get admitted to uh, hospice, I go to Calvary and all over to visit them. But I'm not saying it because I deserve a gold medal for going to see them. That doesn't help them. What would help them is if I was really there to care for them all the time, not pay one visit in a week to the hospice facility. It makes up nothing. I don't know what is the solution for this system because in a way we can't do everything for every patient and we have to divide up amongst teams. And I have to admit that in my entire career in America, I've never met an, onco an oncologist who didn't care for their patients. There must be some, I haven't met them. Everyone really cares and is trying to do their best. And so it's not as bad as it sounds that when we turn over to an inpatient team, yes, there are new physicians, but what I try to do is 
I'll tell them, oh, you're going to see Dr. XYZ. I adore Dr. XYZ. Dr. XYZ is like a son to me. I've known him since he was a fellow. You're going to love them and say many good things that I know personally about the doctor to the patient. And then call up the attending physician on the inpatient service and tell them about the patient, the few peculiarities. This one gets along better with his daughter-in-law rather than his son. So you talk to her and, you know, and then keep involved by phone with them. We are lucky to have all these abilities. You know, I text them, I phone them every day and we remain in touch so that any pressing issues, they'll pass by me. So my point in this is that, yes, it's an abnormal situation. But we have found ways around as oncologists to handle it because all of us know what our patients need and how may not be the most ideal way of taking care of it by sitting in their bedside, but we have many ways of communicating with them. So I actually don't feel as frustrated about this part as some of the other oncologists do. I don't because I have more confidence in my own self that I have cared so much for this patient. I'm going to continue to care till their last breath. I'll be there in whatever way. And if they really want me to come in, I'll go anytime they tell me to come. So again, staying present in their in, in, in the realm of their consciousness at all times and making yourself available. Hey, you can text me 24-7. Every one of my patients has my cell number, as I'm sure yours do. And nobody abuses it. Nobody. If they do, once in a while, you can gently tell them that, no, this is not what the number is for. And they'll correct themselves. So I think that there are very good solutions for it also. And I actually think that experts taking care of different phases of the disease, like the end stage, they know much better than me. Palliative care knows better than me how to control the pain. And believe me, the bone pain and leukemia can be devastating. I feel helpless, but they don't. They know how to deal with it. So it's a good thing to have their help. One aspect of this conversation that uh, I certainly feel very strongly about, I heard you have referenced at a couple of times, is the kind of military or war metaphor often used to talk about cancer or talk about any kind of life-threatening illness, talking about the battle or people losing the battle. I wonder what you think about, you know, whether you use these metaphors with patients and what you think the impact of these sorts of metaphors are when we discuss cancer, when we discuss life-threatening illness. Eddie, lots of authors before me, two of them, Susan Sontag and Siddharth Mukherjee, have also addressed this in very profound ways about these kinds of metaphors. But what I find with my patients is that many of them find it very empowering to talk like that. And I'm going to beat this, Dr. Raza. I am going to battle this and I'm going to win this war. And they have individual empowerment from it. And I would be the last person to try and take that away from them. So whatever helps patients, you try to accommodate their needs above yours. I think that it's a horrible metaphor personally, as you know from my book, that what kind of war is this? We are hurting the patient more with cancer or with the treatment. And what kind of a war is it? Like a civil war where the we've given birth to a new species that's treating our body within our body as a foreign land and trying to kill every normal cell it can for its own good. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are very confusing. And the analogies that we use somehow have evolved into these metaphoric things and sometimes they're helpful and sometimes very misleading. Right. So the next question I was going to ask, I think you already alluded to it, you know, I'll, I'll still ask it and, you know, we can maybe discuss it a little bit, unpack it a little bit more. So, you know, one thing that you have often said and written multiple times is that physicians must harness all of their, you know, not only intellectual, but emotional, psychic, social, philosophical, and even literary resources to engage with patients and their families in repetitive, substantive conversations empowered by empathy, kindness, and understanding. 
So maybe you can expand a little bit on what you mean by this and why it's important for all of us to be emotionally and perhaps even spiritually engaged with our patients. You know, I come from Pakistan and when my parents were alive until a few years ago, I was regularly going back to Pakistan. And any time I landed in Karachi, my mother would have a list of patients I had to see for free because there's so many poor people and she would she was a great philanthropist anyway, and she was always trying to help people. And one time I landed and she wanted me to go see this young woman who's in her early 30s and had lost her husband in an accident. And now she was diagnosed with a bone, with a leukemia, which was, of course, no treatment for it and for her possible. So I went to see her in this shanty town, broken down little place, you know, extreme poverty that you can imagine. But before I could even enter the little hut, there were three little girls sitting outside, ranging from nine years to five years of age. Skeletal little girls, thin, emaciated, pale looking, and they, all, they looked so pathetic. That before I even went in, I asked them, are you guys all right? And, you know, tried to make some small talk and remembered what had happened with my sister also the same thing. When you ask them, well, have you had breakfast today? Imagine what this seven-year-old is going to answer. Her answer, Raj, was, it wasn't my turn to have breakfast today. They take turns to have a meal. If you're going to have dinner, you don't get breakfast. Now you tell me, how am I supposed to go in and talk to a 32-year-old dying of leukemia about her terminal illness when dying of leukemia is only her second biggest problem? Because her biggest problem is this sitting outside. How do you go cold-bloodedly and go in and start talking to the patient now about anything to do with her illness? Why? How is it possible not to be so emotionally and deeply moved and involved? But instead of this kind of thing breaking your spirit, we have to use this to inspire us to never rest for a second in the quest that whatever solutions we are going to find for cancer patients shouldn't be the kind where they're only applicable to ivory towers and only in countries that are so wealthy that, that they can afford to spend a million dollars to save the life of one person. No, we have to make it possible that the solution we find is applicable universally to the most impoverished of our populations. And how are you not going to do that if you don't get emotionally involved? How, how will you even think of developing some different solutions? This is why I have a gut reaction against developing these kinds of rarefied treatments that are impossible to deliver here. They're bringing a country like America on the verge of a financial collapse with a trillion dollars in, in deficit. How are we going to treat a patient like my mother sent me to see? And what are we doing? So literary sources help me somehow pacify myself and find a center and say, no, we must never give up. Let me, since you brought up the literary thing, Emily Dickinson. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. Now think of what she's saying, I measure. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they here had it long or did it just begin? I cannot find the date of mine. It's been so long a pain. I wonder if they had it, I wonder if it hurts to live. 
Oh, what a beautiful line. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they had to try and whether could they choose between, they would not rather die. It's a profound statement. Absolutely profound. Or listen to, this is how I felt after my husband died. I felt a cleavage in my mind as if my brain was split. I tried to match it seam by seam, but could not make them fit. You feel so disoriented. I tried to match them, match it seam by seam, but could not make them fit. The thought behind, I strove to join unto the thought before, but sequence raveled out of reach like balls upon the floor. You see, you read Emily Dickinson and you feel some level of reassurance that others have felt like this before me. A cleavage in my brain, mind as if my brain is split. Somebody put into words the feelings that I had, but I couldn't put into words. And it made sense. And reading Emily Dickinson, because you see, for five years, I was every decision I took, like, should Shahrazad go to this friend's birthday party? Can I arrange a babysitter or not? Was guided by what do I have to do for Harvey in this? Is he getting chemotherapy? Do I have to drive him to the hospital? What is going So constantly every decision was guided by Harvey's illness for five years. And suddenly he dies. Not suddenly, but once he died, I was suddenly left with feeling so empty and just didn't know how to orient myself because everything was guided by one thing which is not there anymore. And it took me, I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't do anything, really. I couldn't go out. I, it became like I was a whole new person. But to reacquaint myself with who I used to be the only way I found was to suddenly, after two years, I decided I have to put a stop to this. And I went back and ordered the 100 greatest books of the Western literary tradition, starting with Aeschylus and Euripides and Sophocles and working my way through Thackeray and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy to Eliot and Edith Wharton to Villa Cather to Salman Rushdie. And just read all the great books. And that took me two and a half years. But it helped me orient myself back through reading. Why? Because when you're reading fiction, especially, you're putting yourself in the shoes of others and feeling their pain. When you're reading fiction, you automatically like some characters. You don't like others. And you ask yourself, why did I have this reaction? So you are getting insights into yourself. And then reading the classics always means that the language is grand, the themes are noble, and the message is startlingly fresh for all times. This is what I mean by having literary references at all times. And not just Urdu poetry like you mentioned in my introduction. I claim to know 100,000 verses in my memory, and a lot of it is in English and Persian also. But, uh, for example, the entire 33rd canto from Dante's Paradiso, 146 lines I can recite. Why? Because it brings such a modicum of relief to me. Yeah, and I clearly remember while reading your book that you had recited a poetry with your patient, who was a young patient with leukemia, I think when you were in Roswell Park, and then you recited the poetry, and at the end, both of you burst out crying, and that gave kind of a like a like emotional relief or a like a spiritual connection, and that was really nice to read. Thank you. Yeah. Now let's talk about some system level questions about serious illness, communication during residency and fellowship. In your long career as an educator, have you seen any shifts over time as to how trainees are taught regarding care of terminal ill patients? 
I think there's been a tremendous progress in this area, personally, Ashwin. Because when I started uh, in this country in 1977, I mean, we were just rushing around trying to deliver chemotherapy and we couldn't really pay that much attention to these things. But with time, whole teams have evolved to compartmentalize and take care of different uh, aspects of the illness. And I think the evolution of this teamwork and team care has been dramatically uh, effective, in my opinion. I think it's a fantastic thing. I'm a very big proponent of the way the system is evolving and has evolved. Yes, there are many problems still and we can do better. But on the whole, the progress has been remarkable. Palliative care and uh, ethics departments have arisen in practically every major cancers, uh, cancer center, whether they are uh, privately owned or uh, university-based. Everywhere, people have realized the importance of giving these kinds of care. So I think it's been a very positive evolution. Do you think that in, in fellowship or during part of any part of the training, we need to have a formal training about this in our curriculum, about taking care of terminal ill patients? Look, I mean, ideally, yes, but these there are some of these things cannot be taught easily. So people who gravitate towards palliative care will do a, eventually a palliative care fellowship and make it their business to help everybody. But for example, if you are a surgical oncologist and you're just cutting out tumors, you really don't have that kind of an expertise to spend time with the patient. So... I mean, to make uh, a universal rule that every fellow going through oncology training should have this or this uh, is uh, too much to ask, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've heard of apps that have been developed that if a patient describes that they are feeling a pain that is six out of 10, then the app will give the doctor a six by 10 pain suddenly, boom, so that the doctor can feel the pain. But that pain, will that make them more sympathetic to the patient or more annoyed with the patient? You don't know. I don't believe in those kinds of things. I think that people who recognize the sensitivity of these things will specialize in those areas. And then I think we should take advantage of our colleagues who have expertise in different venues. I think that teamwork is something that has evolved over the last 40 years in a beautiful way. So no, personally, I think that the burden of training we are putting on our fellows already is too much. In fact, I think this whole demand that you have to do research for two years is completely ridiculous. Because 90% of the fellows we have had end up never doing research. Yet they waste two years of their fellowship or at least one whole year and uh, another half a year trying to do research. I don't see why this burden is put upon. But somehow now... Uh, Somebody was telling me that Dr. Azatu, after fellowship, when we apply for full-time positions, anytime we apply to a university, the first question is, how many clinical trials can you bring? That kind of gave me a jolt because really we are going to now judge people's abilities to care for a cancer patient by how good their communication with a sponsoring industry or big pharma was how do these two how do you reconcile these two things so while i have a lot of criticism for the way we burden our fellows and expect them to do things when we are teaching them something else we're trying to make them into researchers when they don't want to be. They want to go into private practice. But yet their time is wasted in spending in someone's lab, cutting open mice, throwing, you know, tumor cells into their eyes. Those who want to do research, I tell my daughter that your choice of a career should be like choice of a partner in life. Never marry someone you can live with. Never marry someone you can live with. Only marry someone you can't live without. 
There's a big difference these between these two. Because if you marry someone you can live with, then after a while, everything about them will irritate you. Why do they scratch their hair this way? Why do they throw their clothes on the floor? On the other hand, if you are crazy about them and can't live without them, then you can have the worst fight and five minutes later you forget what we were even fighting about. It's that kind of an illogical thing. So in a career, you have to be so invested in your quest of research that you can't not do it. And if you don't feel like that, you don't belong in that place then. I think uh, I think that was a that was a great uh, metaphor. So, Dr. Raza, is it okay if we go like five minutes over, or are, do you have a hard stop at four? No, I don't. I have all the time in the world. I love <laughs> you three, and I'm having. I think no one asks me questions like this. What you are asking me, no one has asked. Me. And I have given hundreds of podcasts and interviews because you guys are so young. You've been through fellowship, and you're all doing. I mean, obviously, all brilliant, mashallah. But you know the questions to ask. So I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are too. So yeah, you know, since the stories have been really powerful, so I really wanted to, you know, ask this uh, final question that you, you have often said and written, you know, how privileged we are to be able to witness how many of our patients accept terminal illness and death with grace. Can you give us an example of any particular patient of yours in over the years that have left a strong impression on your psyche as to how they, you know, face death or face their terminal um, the end of life? I think that uh, my answer would be that 90% of my patient stories would be uh, appropriate for as an answer. But I'll give you the one that I also wrote about in the book, which is the first patient who really made me choose my career in MDS was JC. JC was about my age. She was 34. I was 32 at the time. And for her terminal illness, she had just given birth to twins who were now two and a half when she was dying. And once we had nothing left to offer her for her leukemia, she asked me to admit her to the hospital, which I did. And every evening we would just kind of spend the evening together after my whole day's work was done. And what I noticed was during rounds that she was writing something furiously for a few days every time I went by. And I asked her what she was writing. And the answer she gave changed me forever. She said, well, I'm writing letters that I want my twin daughters to open on each of their birthdays. I've reached their 12th. Keep me alive till I reach their 21st. Here's a 34-year-old who's dying, whose concern is what will her daughters feel like without her on their birthdays. She wrote beautiful. Of course, I couldn't keep her alive. But it made such a huge impression on me that I said, my God, I sh let her die of leukemia. I should have treated her when she had the pre-leukemia. Maybe she would be alive. And that's why I've turned my focus to study pre-leukemia, MDS. Try to intercept before the disease becomes this end-stage monstrosity that we can't control. I think JC lifted the curtains from my eyes like no other patient in her dying days, in her terminal days, with the grace with which she accepted what is happening to her at such a young age was unbelievable. And, you know, it's, as I said, it's like Oedipus when he finds out he has married his mother. He has to blind himself and run away and become some kind of a prophet somewhere. Well, for taking care of JC was a blinding and an unblinding experience for me. When you, when you were reciting the poetry before, I thought it was very 
half i don't know if you've got another poem that you want to leave us with oh, I, I mean i have endless series of poems eddie if you start me off it's like you'll have to press some button to stop me <laughs> <laughs> i love poetry. there's not a day in my life that goes by when i'm not thinking about poetry reciting it you know i'm a runner i run every morning every morning i commit poetry to memory something or the other. Sometimes it takes me several days to commit one particular poem, but I do it. Well, let me, since we are talking about terminally ill patients, so here's another gorgeous Emily Dickinson. But before I... And then I'll end with, with uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, if you don't mind, for all of us. Mm -hmm. But Emily Dickinson talking about death. She, I just went to visit her home. I go there often, Amherst, Massachusetts because I'm such a big admirer of Dickinson. So she had some horrible tragedies happen, but she thought a lot about death. And in this poem, she thinks that death has come to take her away in the form of a gentleman caller, as if she's going on a date. Listen to her words. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly moved. He knew no haste and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. How gorgeous is this life? Another part, she says, Emily was also had a wicked sense of humor. Listen to what she says here. Faith is a fine invention. <laughs> what a line. <laughs> Think of this line. Faith is a fine invention when gentlemen can see. But microscopes are prudent in an emergency. <laughs> here is her division between Athens and Jerusalem, between reason and passion. Think of it. Faith is a fine invention when gentlemen can see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. <laughs> you need reason. You need intellect. You don't need just passion. I'd love for you to read whatever you were going to read, and then we can end with uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, one of my favorite passages also. Sure, yeah. So... Yeah, so I wanted to read out a couple of sentences from your book, the first cell, you know, which I think strikes a chord with our discussions today. So I, I quote, finding a new molecular signaling pathway in the cancer cell is great, of course, and it will earn you awards, acknowledgement in the field and respect from your peers. Trying to heal the patient when they are dying from lack of treatment will not earn you gold medals or appear on your CV, but will make you a better doctor and a finer human being. Bring peace to your own inner life help you accept your own set of affl afflictions that life will inevitably hurl your way. I thought that this was really profound and something that strikes a chord with what we are doing every day and taking care of terminally ill patients with, with different malignancies. And, you know, we sometimes we don't think about it or reflect about it now in the busyness of day-to-day -day life, but I think it's nice to think like it this way. Yes. Thank you so much for reciting. That was a good choice. Well, I have been in this cancer field for the last 43 years now. And as I said, as an oncologist, as a researcher, as the a cancer widow, I've experienced cancer from many aspects. And yet, people ask me, oh, are you still working? Are you still doing research? And I go, no, <laughs> until I can do and think or lift a finger, I'm going to continue to do this. And what gives me a lot of strength again in terms of poetry is this passage from Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Just a passage I'll recite for you. Which is more befitting me than you? The lights begin to twinkle on the rocks. The long day wanes. The slow moon rises. The deep moan rounds with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late to seek a newer world. It may be we shall see the happy isles. It may be we shall see the great Achilles whom we knew. For my purpose still holds to sail beyond all the stars in the western sky. 
And though much has taken, much abides, and though we are not now that force which in olden days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you.